Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Lewis Metzger and I'm the director of New Wine, New Wine Skins. Welcome to New Wine Tastings, where every week we'll have an opportunity to engage people from diverse backgrounds, all in the attempt to build relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. We are desirous of the opportunity to engage in deep and meaningful ways, and we're really thrilled and excited to have you with us. Hello, this is Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of New Wine, New Wine Skins, and this is New Wine Tastings, and always trying to give a taste of new wine in terms of various uh, figures, voices in our contemporary society who are having one finger in the Bible, one finger in the daily news, so to speak, as Karl Barth talked about uh, many years ago, and uh, one needs no introduction in this regard uh, in terms of Carolyn Custis James ministry. It's my privilege to dialogue with uh, a longtime friend, uh, Carolyn Custis James, on her work, and especially as we deal with uh, Women's History Month and her work on Ruth. And also today we're going to be talking about Esther and Esther's import. As I said, I've known Carolyn for many years. Uh, she is from Portland, Oregon. Uh, her father was a professor at Multnomah. Uh, the institution where I teach, and we've worked in a variety of contexts together, and uh, just it's it's great to connect and reconnect with Carolyn um, over and over again. Carolyn, thank you for your time today. Oh, you are welcome. It's always good to talk to you. <laughs> and I just wanted to say a few things further about Carolyn, <clears throat> um, author of numerous books, The Gospel of Ruth, uh, also Maelstrom, Half the Church, the list goes on and on. Uh, Finding God in the Margins, I believe that's your most uh, uh, recent work, Carolyn. Yes. And a few years ago, Christiane Day um, indicated that Carolyn Custis James is one of the 50 women to watch. And I encourage viewers to uh, uh, watch her lectures, to engage her when she's in the area, wherever you live, and also to read her works. Carolyn, again, thanks for your time. And we'll start right up with thinking through Esther. And I've always hoped for you to, to write a book just on Esther. I've heard you talk about Esther. And uh, I just think there's so much there in the book of Esther to have a gospel of Esther book uh, to, to be a parallel <laughs> to uh, the gospel of Ruth. So um, what, what do you think the import may be, Carolyn, of this ancient figure, this ancient queen in Persia, this Jewish figure, Esther, who was... Um, someone in exile, and yet mm -hmm. her resilience just stands out. What is her import uh, in your estimation for international or for uh, Women's History Month? Yeah, one, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is the fact that in the Bible, 90% of the narratives are about men. Mm. And the 10% that we have about women um, because of the cultural backdrop, which is a, an intensely patriarchal world, mm -hmm. when a woman sets foot out on the pages of scripture, I always say there's, there should be a huge exclamation point next to her story mm -hmm. because it's, it's a culture where the women would be kept in the background. Um, they didn't have voice or agency or legal rights. Everything that of value that came to them was through men. You know, who's, who's her father? Who's her husband? And most especially, who, how many sons does she have? Mm -hmm. And Esther sets foot on the stage of, of scripture without any of those things. You know, she's being raised by her cousin, She's an orphan. She's probably very young mm -hmm. because, you know, when the king, and I'm assuming your, your listeners will be familiar with this story. Maybe we shouldn't do that. But um, when she, she's um, living in Persia with her cousin, uh, the, the people of Israel have gone back to their land for the most part in these you know, her, Esther and her cousin Mordecai are stragglers. Mm -hmm. so, so they stay back mm -hmm. um, in Persia. And we don't, we're not given any explanation of that. And um, what happens in the opening scene of the story is that the king's um, giving a big festival, big feast for the men in power in his 
empire. It's a, it's the global empire, the empire of the day. And um, he decides that he wants his wife, the queen, to come and show herself in front of these inebriated men and um, and she refuses. Mm -hmm. And so this creates a big crisis where um, his his advisors tell him to depose her and you know that if if he doesn't deal with this in a real serious way that men will um their their wives will be disobedient to them so then the king needs a, needs a new queen and so what they do is they round you know we just read this matter of factly <laughs> that they round up the beautiful virgins in the um empire for the king to try them out mm -hmm. and decide who he wants well, you know and so many of the stories in the bible are me too stories mm -hmm. that we trivialize or we sanitize but this is this is human trafficking this is sex trafficking mm -hmm. that we're talking about here and in the patriarchal world, if you're a young virgin, if you're a young virgin, you're probably 12 or 13, you know, you're not 25. And, um, you know, because as soon as a, a girl would become, you know, hit puberty, she would be marriageable. And so young virgins are really young girls. Mm -hmm. And um, Esther is one who is rounded up. And um, her story is important for a hundred different reasons, but not if we sanitize it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because especially today, we need stories that will stiffen the spines of little girls mm -hmm. and, and young women and older women that will add the word no to their vocabulary that will empower them um, to have agency and make their own decisions. And what you have here is, is, um, you know, the stories in the Bible are all cast against this patriarchal backdrop. And we've sort of confused that with the message of the Bible. Um, but I don't believe it's the message. I, I'm convinced that it is the backdrop that sets off in the sharpest relief, the power of the gospel message of scripture mm -hmm. and um and so when somebody like esther's story you know comes forward it's it's you know a, a, a revolutionary moment in the in the history of biblical times and um at first she's just a victim of it all you know she's doing whatever she's told she does whatever mordecai tells her she does what she's told when she's you know marinated in spices and perfumes for a year um and and trained to go to the king for for the night um with him when he can decide who who he likes best so you know it's a woman with this who has no power and no um cannot make decisions um and it's it's a it's a real important story for us to tell in its in its true character of what's going on and i think especially now when we have um when we have this me too church to crisis where there's clergy sexual abuse and harassment where it's happening in the workplace um you know it's sad to me that the church doesn't give out a strong message for women and girls mm -hmm. and it's there from page one in the bible and you know we've sort of capitulated to um to patriarchy and to the cult, the culture um, where men have the decision making rights and and they have the power and the privilege um, over women and I think the Bible counters that in so mm -hmm. many different stories mm -hmm. where women step up they have a voice but they're but they're um, and 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 they're 
intimately involved in the purposes of God moving forward. It's not just, you know, now I have a voice mm -hmm. and I have rights kind of thing, but it's, it's always for this, there's something bigger going on. Mm -hmm. And that happens in, that happens in Esther's story. You know, it's not just, it's not about women's rights. It's about image bearer responsibilities mm -hmm. and, that she ultimately, it's, it, there's a huge transformation that takes place in her in this story. And, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a message of hope, isn't it? Because you see the transformation in her life. Uh, you know, and just even if I could just highlight just for my own sake, because I was just so struck by some of the statements you made that, you know, you, you talked about stiffen the backbone. It really is a book that helps women to stiffen the backbone. And I think men to stiffen the backbone too, you know, because it's like, are we gonna come up to the table and identify with the Esters? You, by the time you're done with the story, you see how Mordecai is following her lead, uh, you know, as the queen. He's no longer lecturing her. Uh, he's now following her commands, which is powerful. So, you know, are men gonna partner with women? You mentioned the Me Too movement and uh, just also this transformation that occurs in her we so easily blame the victim and we could say, well, why doesn't she do more at the outset of the story or Vashti? What about Vashti? It's like, well, Vashti, you know, she didn't want to be treated like a concubine. She was the queen and they were treating her, not that a concubine should be, anyone should be treated that way, but they were the ones who were okay. inhumane. She yeah. was the one who was human. And Esther was just this, as you said, just probably just early into her teens, just reached puberty she she doesn't know what to expect what to do but boy does she become a lioness by the time the story is over and so uh anything further uh that you wanted to share just on some of that uh that you were just highlighting toward the end well in in my work i've um come up with the expression the blessed alliance mm -hmm. because in creation when god creates his image bearers they're male and female and he blesses them hmm. and then he gives them the mandate to look after things in his world to explore the earth's resources to be fruitful not just in reproducing hmm. but in how they live you know that they're they're going to be productive and you know that's the history of humanity that you know we've made things out of the earth and we've utilized its resources in incredible ways and you know, if you just look around the room you're sitting in, all the things that we see didn't exist until, you know, human beings, God's image bearers, began exploring and experimenting and creating. And that, that this male and female alliance that God blesses is a kingdom strategy. And, and, you know, what we, we live in a world where we, where the pendulum swings, you know, we think, oh, well, the men have all the power. We want the power. You know, that's kind of how we view this discussion about male and female. And the Bible doesn't accept that. Mm. You know, it, it doesn't accept it on page one. It doesn't ex expect, uh, you know, accept it in Esther's story. Mm. You know, Esther is she is transformed against all the odds. I mean, what happened to Vashti was a shot across the bow for mm -hmm. the next queen. Mm -hmm. You know, do what you are told and don't make waves. Right. And so, you know, that's the world she enters into. It's a world where, you know, she's powerless. In fact, she's going to be used, you know, and victimized. And, um, and yet her migration, her metamorphosis mm. into a person of power and wisdom and risk-taking and leadership ends up benefiting Mordecai. Mm. You know, it's not like, well, we don't need Mordecai anymore. It's like, it's, it's like a both and, yes. and it happens over and over and over again in the Bible. And he uses, you know, his powers to empower her yes. and, you know, say, you have, you have got to step up mm -hmm. and, and she does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his backing isn't minor. 
Exactly. That's all she's got, you know. Yes, and yeah. and you know, at the end of the narrative, he's elevated. Um, she, of course, retains her role as queen, and you know, when she when he does obey, it's because she is queen, and she's operating as queen. That you know, he he obeys, but he's elevated to uh, even greater stature in the in the kingdom. Uh, and again, she retains the status and it stiffens all our backbones in, in a sense. And I know in um, Maelstrom, you talk about how men shouldn't look at this uh, as uh, a matter of losing out, but it's when, when all win, men and women win, uh, each person wins, or when women win, men win, when men win, women should win. It's, that's the way the biblical narrative ultimately presents it. Yeah, and there, are, you know, every time I see this in scripture when it happens, I see three things. Mm. And one is that they're caught up in something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you have that in the Mary and Joseph story, you have it in Ruth and Boaz, you know, that there's something outside of them that they're focused on. So, you know, they're, they're, They've got a mission, you know, it's not about who's in charge or who's got the biggest voice or who has the most power. It's about there's something that needs to be done. And you see what I call um, gospel living where they make sacrifices. You know, she's risking her life and he's, you know, he's going to follow orders now, you know, he's going to have to change how he does things. But again, it's for this bigger purpose. And the third thing that I see is that there is mutual flourishing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, this gender war that we have is, is not how the Bible talks about relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, when God, God's image bearers have a mission, and certainly as the church, we have a mission. And we can't afford to spare anybody because it's not a small mission. And, you know, even in the current coronavirus crisis that we're facing, you know, we need to think, okay, how do we help? What can we do? And instead of thinking, you know, who's the boss or who's exactly. in charge yeah. or who, who's going to get the glory, right. you know, it's like, we're all in, we're going to do this all together. I, one of the best examples I saw of this, and people in Oregon may remember this, it happened in 2006, and it was Frank's brother, who was lost. It's your, your on, husband, your husband. Yeah, yeah. On, lost on Mount Hood, for mm. Kelly James, and two other climbers with him. Mm. And it, uh, and it was the, the news for the, mm. for a week, you know, there was nothing else going on. And so, it was on all of the major media networks. Um, that story they tracked all week. And um, as, as a family member watching this thing play out and seeing in Portland, all of these climbers hit the mountain to try to find those three missing men. And I remember thinking, we don't care if the rescue worker who finds them is a man or a woman, <laughs> you know, we just want them home safe. And, um, you know, they all, we lost all three of them, but you know, it's like when there's a mission, you want everybody to bring, you know, full, full, pull, bring their full selves to the, That's to right. the mission and not, you know, but in, in, in Christian circles, it's like, no, 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 we don't need you. You know, that's what, that's the message women here. You can, you can tend to things over in this corner, but you know, the big things we'll handle. And, and, and we don't do that when it comes to quote unquote foreign missions, right? I mean, so often trailblazers overseas have been women because there was a sense of urgency there. There was, it makes me wonder if, because we do that in the United States, if we don't really have an urgent message in so many ways, because Overseas, we would say, well, whoever it is, so be it, because we got to get the gospel. We have to care for people. But here, if, when, once we start going that direction of like, well, you stay over here, you stay over there, that probably means there's not enough of an urgency 
And uh, John Perkins, we did some talks related to Esther um, here in Portland years ago for a conference. And Dr. Perkins talked about how we need to have that sense of urgency. We need a sense of urgency with Mordecai and Esther, you see a sense of urgency. They're not thinking, okay, who's gonna get the credit like you were saying, but they're all in it together. And Haman was part of a group of people, as you well know, I believe it was the Amalekites, was it not? Who were hostile toward the Jewish people. So that's why Mordecai wouldn't bow to this man, this arrogant Jewish hating person. There might've been more to it, but there was a lot at stake with all this. Mordecai wasn't trying to be a jerk. Uh, this man had no good intention for the Jews and it only expressed itself more. They had the Jewish people to concern themselves with, not their own uh, claim to greatness. Um, that I don't think even played a part in their thinking. So I'm just emphasizing what you've already articulated so well. And I just wonder if we lack a sense of urgency in the state so often in Christian circles and that's why we say, you stay over here, you stay over there. Coronavirus, we better not be doing that to one another. We better be all all hands on deck. Yeah, well, and I think we, you know, we don't always value what people do from Monday to, you know, from Sunday to Sunday. You know, that it's sort of like the, the important jobs, you know, are the ministry jobs or the witnessing job or, you know, but but so many of the stories in the Bible take place. This one took place in the pol in the political sphere. You know, this isn't a there isn't a priest or a prophet or a you know a word from God in in the whole book. Right. And so it's That's in the everyday business of life. How are we living and how are we hmm. moving toward the kind of um, just and righteous world that God wants. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, how do we, how many want to go to the, on the missions trip or how many want to do this project, but it's that sun, after Sunday we scatter and, you know, the book of Ruth takes place in the workplace and in the legal system. It's not in another, it's another book where there's no, there's no word from God that's audible. There's no prophet or priest or, you know, it's just ordinary people tending to what's in front of them mm. and making sacrifices for the good of others. Mm. And that's where, you know, God's at work. That's the kind of world he wants. Yeah. And it's not, I think we're too churchy or something in the way we look at who we are as Christians and we don't see our whole life and our family relationships and our neighbors and our, and our colleagues at work as, you know, a mission, not that we're going to witness them to death, but that we're going to love them. And we're going to be, you know, the, the presence of God that he's with us, you know, and, um, so I, I don't think we have a big enough vision of. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's so well put. And, uh, you know, without vision, people perish, as the scripture says. And, you know, uh, a dean of mine had said to me years ago, as you were speaking, several things came to my mind. And he said, you know, if you don't care how, you know, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can accomplish a lot in life. And again, I think with that sense of urgency, we're not going to care about who's getting credit because, Again, another statement, great leaders are those whose concern for the people far outweigh their own self-concern. Again, that's something Dr. Perkins had shared with me years ago. And I think you see that with Mordecai, you see that with Esther. Um, you know, they're great leaders. The two of them are great leaders. Great leaders uh, concern for the people. They're Jewish people in this case, far outweigh their own self-concern. And I think if, if that's not a word for today, I don't know what is in... Uh, you know, uh, increasingly, it seems in certain contexts, at least, uh, a narcissistic, even nihilistic culture. Um, and I think Esther is a good work for all of us, for um, Women's History Month, for for all people's history month in our present month. So um, if I could uh, ask uh, a, a few more questions, uh, just uh, I'm just so benefiting from your reflections, Carolyn. Uh, you've already talked about some of Esther's development. But if you could highlight 
a few items in particular that really stand out to you. You said there's quite a progression. What for our for our viewers, those or listeners who aren't as familiar with the Book of Esther, and even those who are, how would you bring your um, exegetical expository reflections to bear on that? Some like two, three points that really stand out to you as a, a biblical scholar on Esther, her development. Well, she, I mean, she she moves from sub from object to subject in mm -hmm. this in the character development and the, the character development is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's there for our instruction. You know, this is not just about if you happen to be queen somewhere, you know, this is a story for you, but this is for all of us to learn from. So she's, you know, she's, she's taken, she's mm -hmm. taken when they round up the virgins, she's taken, when it's her turn to go into the king, you know, she's being acted upon. Mm -hmm. She's doing what she's told. She's not, you know, there's just this compliance and it's something their culture mandates and the opening story in the book of Esther is a threat to disobedience, you know? So it's, and they wanted it throughout the empire to be made known that the women need to obey their husbands. Well she's in the seat of power there and she's going to have to obey everybody. And she's taking directions from Mordecai from the sidelines and then, you know, being told everything about how she should look and dress and act and smell. <laughs> and um, then she sees the distress of Mordecai and she doesn't know what this is about. This is about, and she doesn't, she learns that Haman, the king's right-hand man, has uh, su succeeded in getting an edict that it amounts to a genocide of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's not revealed her um, Jewishness. Mordecai has instructed her to keep that to herself because it's a hazard. And... Um, when she learns about this, you know, she's, she's, she doesn't know what to do, you know, and he says, the ball's in your court, because mm -hmm. you're in a position where you can help us. Mm -hmm. And, and it, for her, you know, she's been in, she's been in the, the palace for, I think about six years. She's paid attention. She knows how things work and she, you know, she puts all of that to good use when she is, when he says to her, you know, this, it's up to you, you know, if you don't do something, then nothing's going to change this outcome. And she, and she sees it as, you know, could finish her off if if I die I you know if I perish I perish but she's she's gonna do it and um because she wasn't supposed to just for the viewers and listeners she wasn't supposed to go in without an invitation from the king and I, I think she'd even lost some favor perhaps because it had it been like 30 days or so before he, he had called on her so she said that the law says to Mordecai, she says, if the law indicates it, I'm going to die because, you know, unless he holds out his scepter and gives me the open door, I'm done. And so, the, yeah. yeah, like you say, there, there's a huge risk. The law said you cannot go in without the invitation from the king. Well, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a culture of power that is ruthless. Mm -hmm. I mean, for him to sign off on a a plan for genocide. What kind of man is he? Right. You know, and he's and he's he's not calling her because he's got a whole harem of of young girls he can take his pick for the night. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's a horrible, horrible. So, you know, and I think the Bible does this often where I mean, I often think of Elijah in his battle mm. with the worshipers of Baal. And it's a competition to see whose God can set an altar on fire. Mm. And he pours, what, 12 barrels of water 
on the altar. And the stories, her story, Ruth's story, they're stories that have 12 barrels of water poured on them. You know, the likelihood of anything but a calamity resulting from the actions of these women. And, you know, for a woman to take the initiative, first time I saw that happening in the Bible, it, I had to rethink my whole life, you know, because that's not a word that women, they were supposed to do what they were told, and mm -hmm. especially in this culture. So it's, like I said, there's an exclam exclamation point by this story. There's nothing going for her. She's alone. Mordecai's, you know, outside. Right. And she has to think for herself. She has to put the pieces together. She has to strategize. She has to use what she's observed. You know, all of that comes together in, a, in her plan. She, for the first time in her life. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, but it certainly raises the bar for the rest of us. And, and we should look at it like that. And this wasn't a beauty contest. <laughs> You know, she didn't, she wasn't the winner. You know, it's a horrible story. And I, and I, you know, when you think about the biblical text, it makes these points. But again, in the context of patriarchy, uh, it might not come across as clearly to us. The fact that it's even in the canon, when God isn't mentioned, and the woman is, you know, truly the heroine, you know, she's the focus of the, the story with Mordecai, of course, and the Jewish people. But Still, that in of itself is saying quite a bit. Uh, like you said, you should take all the more note because 90% of the Bible goes toward featuring men. It, it's so striking. And how she operates, the discernment, the way she, you know, the, the king basically looks to her. So what do you want to do, you know, at the end of the day? So <laughs> even he moves toward supporting her. And it has God's handiwork all over it. You know, mm -hmm. God's hand is in place and, and leading Esther. And, you know, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, as Mordecai says, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you were put in this place for such a time as this and indicating that God's providence is at work, that if, if you don't, you and your family, including Mordecai, her uncle, her cousin, or what have you, um, they'll be dis deposed, but God will raise up help from elsewhere. Um, but for such a time as this, it's Esther and uh, just powerful. And, you know, it raises the bar for all of us, as you say, um, uh, women and men, men and women alike. Um, what uh, do you make of the language like women leaders, uh, Carolyn? I don't like the language of women leaders. I just like the language of leaders who are women, leaders who are men. I, I just feel that that language itself sets us up for this kind of boundary um, disengagement rather than all hands on deck. Any thoughts on that? I hear that all the time in certain Christian circles. She's a woman leader. <laughs> I'm assuming you come across that language enough, don't you? You know, I, I have a different way of looking at leadership because, you know, I think we've narrowed it down, you know, where there are certain aspects that have to be present for you to be a leader. And I think being an image bearer is a call to leadership. And, um, you know, because it comes Everybody. with responsibility. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there may be people who have the corner office, <laughs> you know, but we, we all have, look at Esther. She was a young, young, very young woman. And, um, and even still could have been a teenager. We don't know. but. You know, we, we all have responsibility for what's going on around us. And I think it's, it's when you talk about a woman leader, it's sort of a novel concept, you know, just like it would be if we said woman president. <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> and so, but not that, you know, we're, we're called to, we're all called to leadership. It doesn't mean we have followers. It means that we're, taking responsibility and we're acting and women have always done that. <laughs> Absolutely. And just on that point, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, it's not, do we have, not that we have followers. Language I hear a lot of is, you know, who's following you. You, you can tell a leader. I've, I've actually heard this and I've heard it often. You can tell who a person is if they're a leader 
based on who's following them. And I'm thinking that is really distorted with all due respect to those who say they might not mean anything by it. They might not be, I, I know some great leaders who actually use this language, but I just think that's distorted thinking. It's not who's following us. Uh, the question is who are we following and who are we leading? The, the point of reference is not us. It's, it should be God and others, not who's following us. I don't think Mordecai and Esther are thinking about how great their leadership is. They don't have time to be thinking about it. It's like, am I going to be faithful in the moment? That That's what drives them. Am I going to be faithful to what I'm called to do for my people in the moment? And uh, that's what I hear you saying. It's really about that as image bearers. And that puts all of us on the deck. Well, and also that means some of the best leaders we don't even know about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, hmm. I mean, I think of, again, some of the stories of women in the Bible hmm. and, you know, nobody was following them, but they were, they were the point person. And, you know, like Ruth, Absolutely. Ruth was it in today's world, she would be an undocumented immigrant. Yeah. And that would um, invite all kinds of abuse and, you know, uh, yeah, people to, to view her negatively. And she is so amazing mm -hmm. and so, um, so profoundly the leader in that book. Um, and I, you know, but I, but I, she didn't even know what was ultimately happening through their actions. You know, she was just putting food on the table and she was just trying to, to sit, rescue this family that's being extinguished because they don't have a male heir. But, you know, she didn't know that there would be a king that <laughs> would come three generations later where we're ultimately the Messiah. But it was, you know, just family issues, you right. know, doing the best she could for the family. It was amazing. Abigail, Deborah. I mean, Abigail. Look what Abigail does with David and her and her husband, and and yeah. uh, you know, uh, Deborah. You know, she, she doesn't even want to lead the troops, so to speak. And she tells the general, "If you don't, I'm going to get the credit." And she's not looking for the credit, but she's just. You know, you just see these remarkable individuals. Mary, the mother of the Lord. I mean, just how she engages. Uh, what a great saint. Uh, what uh, do you make of critiques that say we need a white history month or men's history month or something along those lines? I, you know, maybe you don't hear those things on the East Coast, but I hear them out <laughs> west. I hear them in Portlandia. Yeah. And you know, it's let's get equal time, right? Yeah. Whatever. Um, you know, to me, that's really, they're not listening yeah. when we have, you know, Women's History Month or Black History Month. There's, they're not listening. And, you know, if they really want a white history month, let's tell the true story instead of what we've been getting in our, you know, high school history books about how wonderful it all was. And, you know, and we'll hear, sometimes <laughs> I, I hear this at least, Carolyn, like, well, this is just identity politics, what I'm doing with interviewing you on this. I'm thinking, well, everyone's got identity and everyone's got politics. The question is, are we even conscious of what it is we are articulating explicitly, subliminally, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I like your wording, we're not listening. How, how are we listening that we're inquisitive to really draw out so that we are sharing, I don't even like to say the stage, I don't believe in stages, I believe in an open table, not a platform, but like a, that we're, we're all sharing space at the table. And uh, that's what you're saying. That's what you talk about in Maelstrom. That's what you talk about in Half the Church. You're talking about like, we're, we're all image bearers. Let's share life together. We, we shouldn't have, as Brueggemann says, you know, this fear of scarcity that, you know, it's, it's just more the matter to highlight what's often lacking. You know, Jesus is engaging us so often at the margins of existence and he himself was operating from the margins you you talk about that in 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 your works uh what are some of the most pressing issues facing women today you mentioned the me too movement uh and then i'm going to ask you about what you're currently researching but what do you see as some of the most pressing issues today in 2020 that we need to be alert to that we need to be listening to in terms of 
concerns that you have that you see related to women. And if it's for women, I think you would also say, then it's for all of us. We need to all be engaged together. But what are some of those pressing issues for girls, for women that you would want to highlight for our, our viewers and listeners? Yeah. You know, I think we've, that we're, that we've made progress. Um, education is making a huge difference for women um, because it, you know, in, it enables women to flourish. And, um, but, you know, that's a global question. And um, there are places in the world where it is not pretty for women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't have, they don't have access to health care. They don't have access to education. They don't have access to um, contraceptives. I'm, I'm reading right now, I'm reading The Moment of Lift by Melinda Gates. Mm. And, um, and what she has learned as she's gone into these different countries, you know, she talks about a woman who, um, you know, had just given birth to a, a baby and um, had one, a two-year-old next to her. And um, she was thrilled with this baby and they were doing all sorts of things with maternal health that made it a better experience for her and for her baby when she delivered. And she was just thrilled with that. And um, Melinda Gates asked her if she wanted to have more children. And she said, I don't know how I'm going to feed this one. Mm. And he won't get an education and he doesn't have, you know, so it's, and, and, and yet she's, she said, my husband works very hard, but he doesn't make enough money to take care of us all. And, and she knows she's going to get pregnant again and there's no, they don't have access to contraceptives. And, you know, that may be controversial for some people, but to me, it's like, you're saving lives when you, when you do that. And, you know, so this can be very basic, you know, that girls aren't getting an education or that they're being married off at a very young age. If you read a book, if you read half the church, what I wrote, which was in part a response to half the sky, you know, they're just, it's it's jarring what's happening. I there was an article in the New York Times recently about the women in in Syria and and it was narrowed down to Aleppo, and they said that a whole generation of men have have are gone. They've been killed, or they're in prison, um, or they've fled, um, and the women who never used to set foot outside their own home without their husband. And he would even go get the groceries so that she would be secluded. Now there's no man. And they're having to go out. They're having to find a job. They're having to walk the streets of Aleppo when there's gunfire and explosions. And, you know, it's upending their lives. And, you know, when I think about those women, and then I think about the message that comes out of the church for women, I think we have nothing to tell them. Mm. You know, if we tell them, you know, the man is the one who protects and provides and that he's the head and you're there, we have nothing for them. If we don't look at these stories and say no, over and over and over again in the Bible, God is calling his daughters against barrels of water to, to, you know, to surface and take the initiative and be resourceful. And that this is, this is a God given calling. It's not a violation of anything. Yeah, that's so powerful. And, you know, back to your point on they're not listening or we're not listening or how well am I, I'm speaking to myself here, how well am I listening? You know, in the book of Esther, you certainly see this where, like you said, 90% of the Bible is geared toward men. So when that 10% features women, we should really listen carefully. <clears throat> how well are we looking today? How well am I looking today? And again, not as someone who's trying to say, oh, now it's their turn, no longer men's turn, as you were saying earlier. No, we're all image bearers. How do we partner together? And uh, 
so with that in mind, I should be looking, I should be inquisitive. I should be looking where are their leaders um, moving up that I need to affirm that I need to say, listen to them. You know, you mentioned Melinda Gates. Uh, it could be others. It could be your, your grandchildren, my, my daughter, daughter-in-law, granddaughter, uh, et cetera. And it's not like, just look for those people who are great leaders, but whoever they are, boys and girls, men and women, to cherish them. But I think, especially in this case, in a situation like Syria, like you're mentioning, how do we look at opportunities to support women? Because they're going to have to rise up. They're going to have to play key leadership roles inside the church, outside the church. How do we support their um, agency? Um, they have agency. They have a voice. Are we listening to their voice? And I think for me, that's what I need to be attentive to, both in the church and in the society at large. Where are those voices that I need to be listening to? And they're all over the place. They don't have to be known voices, but just am I looking to support them and to see them lead rather than to have to somehow squander it for myself? Like, that's not the point. <laughs> Uh, the point is Christ. The point is people, and I—that—that's what I hear coming out loud and clear from your your words now, and every time I've heard you share. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think sometimes we have we have um, we don't understand, like you say, real what is real leadership, and that sometimes, you know, we think we know where God's moving and doing big things but he's very subversive. <laughs> and sometimes he uses a young girl. Sometimes he uses a little boy. You know, sometimes he uses an elderly person. It's not somebody always that's ob an obvious leader. And, and, and some leaders are doing a lot of damage, as we know from the church too. And sometimes it's people from the grave. I mean, my parents have more and more influence. I mean, my mom just passed away, but I feel like my parents have more influence on me now than, than, than ever before. And they weren't known quantities, so to speak, but they were faithful, faithful to love, faithful to hope, faithful in faith. And, um, and I, are we listening? Back to your point, are we listening to others, uh, to God? Lastly, what are you currently researching, Carolyn, as, as uh, we come to an end, but moving forward? Because I do know that some of my viewers are going to be really excited to know that we have this interview for them, and uh, they love your work, and I just want to highlight more of what you're currently working on. A um, couple of things. I've, done, I've been doing work on the Me Too Church to crisis, and I've ta I taught a course at Missio Seminary. In about Philadelphia. Yep. Right, right. Yep. Um, and I'm, you know, the gal I worked with, Heather Evans, Dr. Heather, Heather Evans and I are talking about next steps because mm. it's so easy to, you know, have an event and say, you know, well, we talked about this and then you move on and you don't, it's, it's still festering, you know, and so I'm looking at, from my piece in all of this has been to look at the roots. What are the roots? Why is this happening in the church? Why is it church leaders who would be abusing members of, of their church? Yeah. Um, what is it about our theology that's contributing to the problem? I think those are questions, you know, I don't think we can leave any stone unturned because this is such a sickness that, that we're facing. And then at the other end of the spectrum, Frank and I are um, working, we're in the research stage, I keep saying that, um, to write a book on the Blessed Alliance. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more complicated than I ever thought. And, you know, we have these long discussions where we, you know, it, it's, and there's so much that works against it, mm. you know, and um, there are examples of it in scripture. I think Esther and Mordecai are a beautiful example mm. of 
you know, a man and a woman and they reverse roles. It doesn't matter what they have to do because there's this bigger mission mm -hmm. that they're both invested in and they're all in hundred percent. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's what we're doing. And I'm, you know, I always want to keep learning. So I, I've been jumping in over my head <laughs> some of the things I'm reading, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I read uh, Mir uh Exclusion and Embrace, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But it's it's you you know you ha somebody said to me I can't get in I can't get into it and I said get into it <laughs> because because this is my second try to read it and it's just you know I'm thinking that that's an amazing book. I've also been reading um, Moltmann. Mm -hmm which is really work. Um, and what I love about both of these men is that they are both coming in their theology from a place of horrible pain. And so it's really theology that's rooted in the ground. You know, it's not up in some tower. Right. And they're asking questions that you don't ask unless you're mm -hmm. in a lot of pain. Hmm. And uh, so that, you know, because I just, I want to keep, I want to keep growing, you know, there's so much more to learn and. Isn't there? That's for sure. And, and uh, just to, to refer back, I, I think with what you mentioned about Wolf and Moltmann and, you know, on the ground, not up in the tower. I mean, your work is about being on the ground, you know, as you engage scripture, it's what does this speak to our current situation? When you gave the commencement address at Multnomah years ago at the university, it was just, it was very much living color. What does this text say to us today? Understanding it in its original context, but okay, but it speaks to our context too. And it was very prophetic. And that's one of the reasons why I love, you know, uh, in, interacting with your work and such, because it's very grounded. And I think, you know, just with what I know of you and Frank, your husband, you know, the president there at the seminary and, and just what uh, you've done together. I mean, you've, you've lived that. I mean, I think you have. You've lived that blessed alliance for, for a long time together. And uh, just so I think it's going to come out of a, a life that's grounded, so to speak, when you, when you do that book. I look forward to seeing that book on that blessed alliance in, in due course. Uh, Carolyn, thank you so much for your time. Uh, as always, and just really grateful for you and your calling and your work. And I look forward as you listen and learn uh, to share it with others, to share it with us so that we can learn as we listen. So Carolyn Custis James, I encourage you to read her work. What's uh, the best website to find out more about your work, Carolyn? It's my name, carolyncustisjames.com. carolyncustisjames.com. And uh, please go there uh, to find out more about her work. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for New Wine Tastings. Carolyn Custis-James, this is Paul Lewis Mutzker. Thank you for joining us today.